Hi, everyone. Let me know if you see me. Let's see if you have found me. Yes, I see myself. Awesome. Drop a hello if you see me. Um, let's take everyone. We are going live on a super popular topic. I see Tanya join me, Narmina join me, Cindy Hutchinson join me. Uh, on we're going live on belly fat hormone. I'll just say I'm just gonna type this so everybody can find me. Awesome. I see Wanda, uh, Sherry. Uh, yes, yeah, Cindy Hutchinson. Hi, Cindy. Good to see you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. If you are uh, just joining us, this is live number 132, which is crazy. 132 lives that I've done. And the last time I did a cortisol live, it was live number three. <laughs> so 130 lives ago, I did a live on cortisol. Now, 130 lives later, I'm going to do another one. So this should be an exciting topic. Hi, Antoinette, Sandy, Jennifer, awesome, Shirley. Uh, so this topic is let's talk about the number one belly fat depositing hormone. Uh, this is actually, you know, I know it's going to be super popular because this impacts everyone. You know, it's, I don't think anybody is immune to it. I think everybody gets impacted by cortisol. Okay. Uh, hi, Jennifer. Thanks for all the hearts. Uh, so if you're joining us here, this is the Fierce Woman community where we sculpt powerful bodies and champion mindsets. If you're joining us on YouTube, drop a hello as well. I know there's a few really avid followers on YouTube now. So thank you for uh, watching it from over there as well. Um, first of all, let's uh, give some wins and congratulations. Uh, so first of all, congratulations to all the anti-bloat challenge participants from last week. If you participated in it, give yourself lots of hearts or cheer on those ladies. Uh, they did so well. We did post about their wins on Monday um, and we had people losing like six, seven pounds, I think um, five inches off their belly just in like four days, right? And that's what's cool is that there's a method to the madness. You know, there's definitely a way that you can actually bring down bloating and belly fat and all of that. So I'm super proud of all you who did the anti-bloat challenge. And if you are just joining um, us and didn't get to do that challenge, put free challenge below so that, um, you know, we can tag you on the next free challenge that we do. So if you want to yeah, join that, put free challenge below. Okay. Uh, awesome. So let's uh, also give a shout out to all um, all my newer transformation clients. So I just wanted to give a shout out to a few of the new ones. So first of all, Stacey Carpenter is in the fourth week of her transformation program, and she has now lost 32 inches off her body. So give her lots of cheer, cheer on her. I know she doesn't even know that. I texted her and she's like, really? I lost 32 inches. I'm like, yes, you have. <laughs> so great job, Stacey. Um, I know just, just, it's just four weeks. So we have a lot more to go. So super proud of you. Uh, Rosanins, I did give her a shout out last week, but she is in week five. She's lost 38.5 inches off her body and 6.6 .6 inches coming off her belly. Um, so that's really, really awesome. And then Jody Peebles, who's in her ninth week, um, she's lost 38.5 inches and get this 10.5 inches off her waist. And Jody is actually a relatively lean person. Like if you looked at her, you would think she's like lean and fit. But who knew she had 10.5 inches to lose off of her waistline <laughs> because, you know, no matter how lean or fit you think you are as you age, just like she said, it seems to just accumulate in the belly. And that was one of her goals when she came to find me. Hi, Jalen. Nice to see you. I know we're talking in Messenger. Um, so if you are wanting to learn more about all our programs, um, you can drop programs below. Uh, we are in the current uptake for the FFF Fierce Factor Group Coaching Program. This is going to be the last week uh, about, what is it, nine days or so to go. And we are all the FFF ladies that you're registered. I know Sandy Kessinger, you're on here, you're in the FFF uh, and a few others. Um, 
we are starting next Friday the 20th. So uh, that's going to be very exciting. So if you don't want to miss our last round of the group coaching program for this year, does that, that will be the last one for this year, drop FFF below to learn more in regards to that. Okay. So awesome. So we have uh, 10 eyeballs with us. I see Solly join, joined in as well. Awesome. So um, I want to just start off with a little bit of uh, what well, just like a mini mini story and then I want to ask all of you who who kind of relates to this so a lot of people actually ask me a little bit around like do you struggle with belly fat or have you like I mean like obviously you know it's like you may see the the end product or someone who's understood or learned how to actually eat and know their nutrition really well but I I um I went back to my live number three. I remember talking about this and um, I, some of you may know I was a school teacher before and I remember being incredibly stressed all the time and just uh, like being so stressed and drinking <laughs> tons of Starbucks coffee, not the best for you, but Hey, I didn't know back then any better. Um, so I was drinking like tons of Starbucks coffee. I was stressed all the time. I was like lacking sleep all the time. And I remember like, it was like, you're always your digestive system just was like crappy all the time. Um, I remember feeling like, why do I have belly fat? Be even though I'm a leaner individual, and especially the uh, belly fat and back fat, because it kind of it goes around, right? And it was very frustrating for me for a long time because as a dancer, you hate that kind of stuff. You don't want any of that excess fat around your belly. Nobody likes that. And so uh, no matter what age you are, I do believe, and I have young people that are 20 year olds and um, over on Instagram who want to watch this live because it's not just you in menopause that is struggling with belly fat. Like when it comes to cortisol, cortisol will make you have a fluffy middle. And no matter what age you are. And I just remember being, um, yeah, Tavana, Tavana, you're younger. I think Tavana, you're only 20 something, if I'm correct, who just popped in here. Uh, thanks for the heart, Nicole. I appreciate that. Um, and so I remember just being um, constantly frustrated, honestly. And I don't, I sometimes I share, but like, it's like, it's important for you guys to hear, right? Like I went through a period in time before I was a trainer, before I understood all the health and fitness content concepts that like, I had to just keep like starving myself, not eating a lot to try to like lean out the midsection. But no matter how much leaner I got, it was like always this midsection issue that was like just so frustrating. And for me, I think that's the biggest thing is people don't, if you don't understand cortisol, cortisol is going to be your biggest culprit for having you have a fluffy middle center with belly fat and back fat and low back fat. So um, I want to ask all the people who are watching here. Um, yes, Tavana's 23, exactly. And you said you struggle with a belly, I know. And I have a couple of people on Instagram who voted on my story and they're maybe early 30s as well. So the women on here who are 40, 50, 60s, like you're not alone in that this is a common struggle with every woman, right? And so who relates here? I know Tavana says she relates. Who relates here? Who is struggling with your cortisol or fluffy middle or like, just like, oh, it's so frustrating. Like you, you're trying to be healthy. You're trying to work out uh, all of that, but you still struggle with uh, the belly fat or fluffy middle. So Jenna says, yes. Who else relates to that? Who else relates to the fluffy middle, the cortisol, the cortisol belly, the, uh, you know, low back fat, all of that. Um, Nicole says, yes, the stress hormone cortisol, the menopause makes it worse. Exactly. So, um, you know, I think a lot of women and Sandy Kessinger says that as well. Um, all of you and Jennifer as well. Um, and so, you know, this is quite common no matter who you are. And I just want you to know, it's like, because sometimes people like, you know, obviously people are like, well, you're not in menopause. Have you struggled with that? Like, okay. You know, I, like Tavana, who's 23 here, she'll say, yeah, there's a woman do struggle with fat in the belly area. Let's be honest. Okay. And, and no matter like whether you're menopause or not, it might get worse and it might be even harder in menopause, but yes, I have had a period in my life when I didn't understand nutrition. It's why I'm so adamant on nutrition. Cause once I understood nutrition and once I became maybe an, an expert in it, 
wow, my life changed, right? Like I understood so much around like how much better I felt when I truly understood how to deal with all those like things relating to your belly and the fat and the accumulation of fat and all of that, right? Um, uh, <laughs> Tabata, you're so sweet. Tabata, it's actually my uh, backdrop. I, I don't know if you know, I like to choose different backdrops for my backdrop, but you're very sweet. It's a, it's a way for me to be able to like dream build my, my dream house one day, Tavana. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's dive into it. Okay, so there's a lot that I want to cover. And I think for some of you listening today, you will likely want to rewatch this, you probably will want to take notes, because there's a lot of complexity regarding cortisol. Okay, so the first thing is, um, what is the role of cortisol in your body? Okay, so let's first talk a bit about it. Uh, cortisol um, is uh, well, we often call it a muscle wasting horm hormone. Um, it's catabolic, and I'm going to be explaining why, but this hormone is needed. Um, this hormone is needed for the fight or flight response. It's to get your systems going, right? So this is why you actually need cortisol to actually wake up because it gets your systems going. If you had no cortisol, you'd like not get up or wake up. So there is a good part to cortisol. Um, yeah, the Tibetan. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, one day to have a house like that. Exactly. Um, and so uh, it, it can be a good thing and is a great thing for when you need it, right? When you are like rushing or you need to run really fast, like I said, away from a bear or somebody chasing you. This is a good thing. Cortisol has its purpose, but cortisol, um, because of its complex role, when it is actually continuously secreted it is going to impact a lot of things. So the first thing you have to understand is cortisol is a hormone, right? And this hormone dictates how your body will use protein, carbs, and fat in your body. Okay. So it's going to dictate how you use protein, carbs, and fat. So that means that if there is a incorrect signaling for your cortisol, this will impact the way your body uses nutrition. Okay. So um, during the release of cortisol in your system, your body will get flooded with the signal to release sugar into the bloodstream. That's how you're going to get all that energy at once. Um, and you're going to, uh, you know, obviously um, be able to do things you never thought you could do before. Uh, so the arteries of your heart starts to narrow so that you have faster pump, right? Um, and then insulin actually gets secreted, um, sorry, insulin actually gets inhibited by the cortisol. And insulin is uh, the opposite of cortisol, okay? So uh, I'll talk about the role of insulin. Insulin regulates blood sugar. So when cortisol is present, um, insulin cannot help your body bring sugar into the cells because cortisol is trying to take the sugar to your bloodstream. So they're kind of like opposing each other. Okay. Um, so a lot of like physiological changes happen when cortisol is present in your body. And this is, this is going to be important for you to understand why this becomes really detrimental if you have a lot of cortisol in your system. Um, who here, again, I know some of you just popped in, a struggle with high cortisol. You think you have high cortisol. Put high cortisol if you think you struggle with high cortisol um, or maybe medium cortisol. So put high cortisol or medium cortisol there, okay? So um, hi, Shannon. Thanks for popping in. So there are a number of reasons why cortisol will spike in your system. I'm going to go through, uh, you know, about 10 things that will potentially spike your cortisol. And I want you guys to tell me, um, hi, Sandy, say hi, cortisol. Yeah, Sandy. Um, who else feels like they have high cortisol? Put it below. Now, I am going to go through 10 things that potentially will spike your cortisol. And I want you to tell me what potentially of these 10 things you feel like potentially would cause you, yourself, a spike in your cortisol level. Okay. So obviously, first is physical stress. 
Um, yes, lab tested off the chart. Yeah, Sherry. Yeah, you can get tested for cortisol. You can have a saliva test for cortisol. You can test your cortisol level for sure. Uh, so Sherry is pretty high. Hi, Carol. Hi, Kelly. Okay, so first of all, physical stress. So physical stress will cause cortisol spike, of course. But I want you to think about if you've been sick, illness, injury, surgery, physical trauma. I know, Sherry, you have had physical trauma in terms of like injury from work. Um, that will cause a big spike in your cortisol level. Okay. So one is physical stress. Number two could be psychological stress. As you guys know, your emotional or psychological stressors like work relationship, financial worries, major life setbacks, those cause cortisol to spike as well. Um, third could be exercise. And then this is something I talk a lot about. So if you exercise in the wrong way, you have two intensive types of physical exercising too much high intensity interval training, too much hit, um, and and too much strenuous types of exercising. This can cause massive strike uh, spikes in your in your cortisol. Uh, hi Tracy, good to see you. Uh, Shanna says all stress. Yeah, so you have a lot of stress in you for sure. Um, so exercise could be another one. So think about your exercise. I want all of you that are listening to think about that. Another thing that could cause high cortisol is caffeine. Do you have a lot of caffeine that goes into your system? You drink a coffee in the morning or um, excessive coffee consumption that can cause cortisol spike. Uh, hi, Wendy. Thanks for popping in. Poor sleep. I know Tracy just popped in, so I know this one relates to her. Poor sleep causes also cortisol rise because you're not getting um, your proper rest, okay? Number six is nutrition, um, diet and nutrition. And um, I speak a lot about this. So if you don't eat regularly, you like to skip meals or you like to consume, um, you know, high processed foods and sugars and just don't have a really good understanding of nutrition, this can cause spikes in your cortisol as well. Um, and I will also say, and I know that this is a little bit up you know, in that controversial type of topic. But if you are on intermittent fasting, um, that is something that I would say, like, you really have to consider contextually if that's the best for you due to the hormonal signals that are being secreted when you are on intermittent fasting. I'm not saying it's all bad, but there are certain signals that maybe you as a woman in menopause or in certain stages of life may not benefit from that. I'm just saying that that's something that I'm just going to throw out there. Um, hi, Kat. Good to see you. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Michelle. Um, as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm going through the reasons why your cortisol will spike to make you guys think. And then I want you to tell me which ones you think are going to contribute to your cortisol spike. Uh, number seven is inflammation and infection. So I talk a lot about your inflammation in your body is going to cause the cortisol to start to rise in your system. Or if you're going through a sickness or infection, that's going to cause your cortisol to rise. Uh, number eight is medications. Certain medications will cause your cortisol to rise, such as uh, corticosteroids, if you're taking certain things for um, certain conditions. Okay. Um, so Janet, yours is lack of sleep. You said that will cause your cortisol to rise. Yeah. Um, and then nine is caffeine and alcohol consumption. So if you like alcohol, Cindy, are you on here? <laughs> Cindy Hutchinson. Uh, but I think you've really improved, right? So um, so like caffeine and alcohol consumption can really increase cortisol production. And of course, number 10 is if you're environmental factors. So if you're around things that have extreme temperatures, pollution or noise type of environments that can also spike your cortisol in your system. Okay. So of all those things I just named off, okay, which ones do you feel like you really causes you high cortisol? Okay. Um, Sherry says anger, pain, and diet. Okay. So anger, if I'm correct, anger, then that would be emotional management is causing you cortisol, Sherry, pain, um, and, and your nutrition. Exactly. Sherry, um, Tracy says insomnia, yeah. Lack of sleep and trying to keep your macros on track. Yep. Yours is a lack, uh, your sleep. I know right now you're struggling, Tracy. So, um, that can also cause cortisol spike. Um, Nicole says I lower coffee and notice a difference. Yes, I skip meals because of my work, some stresses in my life. I have back pain and barely sleep. Yeah, exactly. So there's a number of factors, Nicole, you're struggling that is causing a cortisol spike. Um, <laughs> she's 
totally joking because she just doesn't like any cardio. So any cardio, she's like, no, I don't want to do cardio. You're so funny. Uh, Cindy Hutchinson says work, stress, caffeine, and wine. Yes, Cindy, we talked about this before about the wine, right? About the alcohol. So, okay. So uh, I see a lot coming in. Uh, yeah. My mom recently stopped drinking coffee. That's good. I'm so happy. And she quit smoking. Good. Awesome. So this is to make you guys think about all the things that is causing cortisol spikes in your body. Um, because I'm going to talk about like, that's why I said it, it impacts everybody, including I said me at one point, and it probably, I'm always going to have some cortisol, but it's how do you control it and understanding, like, how do we bring down cortisol as much as we can, um, to be as healthy as possible. Right. So, um, my detox citrus tea is an excellent replacement for coffee. Yes, yes. A lot of my detox stuff is really good for you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about seven major areas that has major implications for you. Uh, why cortisol and high cortisol, chronic cortisol in your system is dangerous and really unhealthy, and you need to learn how to control it. So the first, the first thing we're going to talk about is blood sugar imbalances. So when cortisol is high in your system, like I said, it is it has a very close correlation with uh, cortisol and insulin. They affect each other, okay? So cortisol is the stress hormone. Insulin is the blood sugar regulator hormone, okay? So to help everyone understand is when cortisol is, is needed, the body sends a signal, I need to produce cortisol right now. And it's, it floods the system with cortisol um, immediately forces, like I said earlier, all the blood sugar to a lot of release of blood sugar into the, uh, well, the sugar into the blood stream. So there are a lot of sugar is entering the bloodstream now, right? And where is it coming from? So here's the thing is insulin then gets impacted in that it gets shut off, right? The response of the cells now shut off its response to insulin because of cortisol. So now sugar can't enter your cells anymore so that it can be pushed to the bloodstream. Okay. Um, this has a lot of impact on your body in regards to sugar, not being able to enter cells or enter into your muscle base and all of this type of stuff. Um, but to keep on track to this concept, when blood sugar is high, okay, um, it can cause a lot of um, kind of things that can start to happen in your body, okay? Um, also, in terms of the sugar, where else is it coming from? Cortisol also causes glucogenesis. So I want to explain what this is for all of you who love to build muscle. Glucogenesis is the process in which the liver produces glucose from non-carbohydrate sources like amino acids, meaning it's now going to steal from your amino acids to now produce sugar to go to your bloodstream. Um, and if you know that amino acids actually are needed for muscle building, what's happening is cortisol is stealing away a lot of these needed uh, nutrients from your cells, your muscles, and um, the amino acids building blocks for muscle building, okay? Um, so that the sugar can be in the bloodstream for your body to, to be used by the cortisol, right? So we're gonna still stay in alignment to this first concept. I'm not gonna talk about muscles yet. That's the next thing I'm gonna talk about. But in this first concept is if you have a lot of high sugar in your system, okay? Your body has this like weird signal where it's confused now. Because it's like, I'm not getting any sugar into my cells. I need, I need sugar to function. I need energy. So it's going to then tell the pancreas that produces the insulin to keep secreting more insulin. Okay. So now your, your pancreas is now being overworked. It's trying to secrete more insulin. Why? Because it's trying to figure out a way to get sugar into your system. Okay. Into your cells, the uptake, but then cortisol is present and cortisol now is creating a signal that's blocking that. Okay. And it's blocking the uptake of the sugar. So now your pancreas is like trying to produce, 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 produce. And that's why over time, chronic cortisol and the impact of 
uh, high sugar in your system could lead to pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, where your body can no longer produce enough insulin to keep up with kind of the sugar situation in your body. This causes a massive disruption in your blood sugar level, in your metabolism. And this is why, uh, you know, a lot of people as they age, they start finding out their blood work has high blood sugar. They might be pre-diabetes or they might be reaching type 2 diabetes. Okay. And even if you are not type 2 diabetes, you could be insulin resistant. Okay. Insulin resistance would mean that your cells are not responding to insulin. Okay. And if it's not responding to insulin well, um, you have problems processing carbs. And this is going to have impacts in your body. Okay. So this is this is the first thing I want you to understand is the really tight correlation of cortisol with insulin response and proper blood sugar regulation. If you don't monitor proper cortisol in your system, this can lead to a lot of situations in your body. This is a really scientific explanation of, of it. Um, and I, I, you know, wanted to make sure, you know, first of all, you understand the science base. So I'm curious who here is pre-diabetic, type 2 diabetic, or have been tested at high sugar level. If any one of you who are 20 eyeballs on here or on YouTube when you guys watch this, uh, put below if you are. If you struggle with pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or high sugar levels, um, put it below um, because this is something that's going to be really important for you. And if you struggle with that, part of it controlling cortisol is going to be really crucial, a part of that. Okay. So, um, yes, make sure you put that below. Okay. Uh, Shannon, you said, oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, enjoy your last day in Ka Kabul. <laughs> I wish I could be there with you. That's awesome. Okay. So, um, that's number one. Okay. I don't know if you guys, uh, those, are, that, those of you who are listening knew this about the really close correlation between cortisol and insulin. Okay. And Pam, you're type two diabetic. Okay. So this is going to tell you that stress and cortisol has a huge impact on your body. And, um, you know, obviously that means you don't process carbs as well. And that that's why you're trying to learn the nutrition, right? Pam is now just starting her transformation program. Uh, thanks for, um, sharing Pam. All right. So number two, so kind of going from that base, right? Let's talk about why high cortisol now is going to impact you to have difficulty building muscle and to maintain lean muscle mass. Okay. So just like I said before, cells are now not getting the energy it needs. So the cells are kind of starving for energy. Um, so now your body can't function optimally. Okay. Um, and the second thing I said earlier is when cortisol is high, it is now going to create glucogenesis, which is where it's going to now take from the amino acids to now turn it into sugar. Amino acids are usually used to build protein, to build muscle. Okay. It's usually, it usually your body will go for carbs first, but it will take from your amino acids when it is high cortisol. And so why is this uh, really important? Because Amino acids actually not only impact muscle development, okay? It, it impacts, if you don't have enough amino acids, uh, it impacts your hormone production, okay? So a lot of uh, amino acids, not all of them, are precursor to some hormone productions, okay? So what kind of hormone production does it impact? It can impact your insulin hormone, your um, growth hormone and your thyroid hormone. And so if it is now stealing from those amino acids, it can affect your hormonal levels in your body. And this will be why potentially if you have high cortisol, you're going to be impacting the metabolism and muscle growth potential of your body. Okay. So hopefully this is making sense to all of you. And that the amino acids is also connected to your enzyme functions. So your enzyme functions, thank you for the thumbs up. I appreciate the uh, audience uh, communication. Um, and the enzyme function is um, related to, so amino acids uh, connect to some of the enzymes, right? So if the amino acids are now taken to produce sugar in the bloodstream, 
now you don't have as much enzymes in your body and that will radically impact your digestive system, your energy production and various metabolic processes, right? So you're like, oh, like, wow, it's affecting everything. Yeah, it's affecting your hormones. It's affecting your digestive system. Amino acids are also precursors to neurotransmitters in your brain. And one of the neurotransmitters it's responsible for is tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor for serotonin, which makes you feel good and mood regulations. So when cortisol is super high, it will actually, of course, impact your mood and you're going to not feel great. You're going to feel crappy. You're going to feel irritable, right? Uh, and, uh, and then as well, when amino acids are affected, amino acids are needed for immune functions. Um, and one of the immune, uh, things that it usually produces is glu uh, glute, glu uh, glutathione. That, that's right. Glutathione. <laughs> I think I said it right. Glutathione. Uh, glutathione helps with detoxifying your body um, in, in, and it helps you remove stressful elements in your body. Okay. So your body is under a lot of like, you know, um, like I always talk about inflammation, all this type of stuff. So if it's now cortisol stealing all of this like ability for your body to like regulate, you can see how inflammation will rise in your system. Maybe more toxins will accumulate. Cortisol and inflammation, as Clary says a lot, can lead to a lot of diseases. Um, and amino acids also relate to nitrogen balance, okay? So nitrogen balance is extremely important for muscle development. And so when cortisol is present, like I said, it is stealing from amino acids and things that it needs to do all these functions in your body. And now you are, your functions, your metabolic functions, your digestive system, your neurotransmitters, your nitrogen balance, your muscle building potential, all are, you can understand now, suppressed, right? It is not able to function fully. This is why I say you have to learn how to control cortisol in your body, okay? Um, um, yes, so Nicole says, not sure, last blood test was good. Yes, everything you're saying is true, but then you have problems with your adrenals. Uh, yes, adre adrenal fatigue and all of that, right? From, from too much of that, like cortisol being secreted. Exactly. Uh, Kelly says my body is in full out war. Yes, Kelly. And I think a lot of people when they don't understand what's happening, um, and they don't really know their nutrition and the ways to manage things. This is why you just cannot get rid of the belly. It's not just about going to exercise. It's not just not eating food and starving yourself. And like, no matter what your belly is just not disappearing because there's a lot of other factors involved. Right. So hopefully this is helping you understand Kelly. Hi, Cecilia. Good to see you. And Sherry and Audra and Kelly who jumped in and Christy. Awesome. So um, let me, let me ask everyone who's listening. Uh, and if you jumped in, I said at the very beginning, this is probably a live you want to rewatch and you want to probably take notes because there's a lot behind this, but what I just mentioned about cortisol and its impact on like glucogenesis, stealing amino acids, is that new for all of you? Did you know that? Or was it new? I'm kind of curious, a stupid belly cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you could, you know what? It's not even a stupid belly. It's almost like, like, almost like stupid hormones. Like, why do they all have to connect to each other like this, like this big complex highway, right? Like it's, <laughs> they just, everything affects everything else, right? Um, but I'd like to know if this is new for all of you, if you're learning something new here, because this is, I think, a lot, what a lot of people don't understand. You understand cortisol is not good for your system, but at a deeper level, do you really know why this is such a big issue, right? So Sherry says this new, good, awesome. Uh, hi, Dee and hi, Robin. Thanks for jumping in. Okay, so um, as well, um, oh, awesome, Kat. Good, awesome, in your PT course, awesome. And Jennifer says new. Now, in terms of uh, high cortisol, the other part of it affecting muscle building is because it steals glycogen from the muscle cells, right? So glycogen is the fastest uh, source for energy for your cells to use, okay? I see a lot of new. So this is all very new for a lot of you. That's really good. So it will also, not only is it stealing, like as in the glucogenesis and the amino acids, but it is stealing from the, the muscle cells, right? Like the glycogen in there and from your liver. 
And why do you need glycogen? So remember, glycogen is your fastest sugar source for your muscles and your cells to use. It is this preferred energy source. So if cortisol is high and it's taking glycogen away from those muscles, suddenly you are not going to have as great energy for your workouts. You can't, you don't have as good of endurance. And I know I've, I've talked to some of you where you're like, I used to be able to do more in my workouts or I get tired faster, you know? So if you're not able to have as great endurance in your workout. Um, if you don't have great glycogen, you, uh, you're not going to have as great muscle contractions. Okay. Muscle contractions are going to be inhibited. Um, you're going to be inhibiting protein synthesis because glycogen needs to be present for protein synthesis it is going to cause greater muscle breakdown because glycogen preserves the muscle building process. So uh, yeah, if you don't have glycogen, it's going to break down your muscle faster and you will not be able to push as hard. Your intensity of workouts not going to be as good and your recovery for your muscles will not be there if cortisol is high. And this is something I want to make sure you understand is that if you are working out super hard, but you're not learning how to control your cortisol, whether it's through like nutrition and inflammation, controlling inflammation and all these things I talk about, you're, you're going to have difficulty building muscle no matter how hard you work out, right? Because you're, you're, you, this situation and this hormonal situation happening is, is not, you're not giving it the ability to actually truly um, build muscle with the right nutrients and, um, you know, the right signals. Uh, Cindy says, not new, good, awesome, awesome. Um, but from me first, yeah, exactly. But it's kind of helping you review a lot of these things that is really important, right? So I want to know everyone who's watching. Um, I see Denise jumped in, Anna jumped in, and Melissa jumped in. Um, so all of you who are listening, who here struggles with building muscle? So I want you to put struggle building muscle if you feel like you know, you're working out super hard, you're doing everything you can, but the muscle is just not building um, the way you want. So put difficulty building muscle if you feel that is you, okay? Difficulty building muscles. And this is to kind of make you think, you know, beyond just going to work out and lifting weights, are you learning to control cortisol and stressors in the body? Uh, again, are you doing the right types of workout? And is your nutrition proper? Okay. So if you have difficulty building muscle, put difficulty building muscle below uh, to kind of identify for yourself if it could be this situation causing it, right? All right. So that is number um, uh, two. So we're going to go on to number three. Number three is high cortisol often leads to low energy, okay? Um, because high cortisol causes a chronic fatigue in your body. Uh, like I said, again, it's kind of stealing all the resources away from all the other things that it needs to do. Um, it has impact, as I mentioned, on your mood, anxiety, and irritability. So cortisol um, basically leads you to feeling like crappy, right? Kind of like that like anxious feeling it will make you feel really anxious. And um, high high cortisol will affect your sleep patterns, right? And so uh, if you have high cortisol, you'll actually have trouble falling asleep and then trouble staying asleep, okay? So I'm curious who here that is watching, uh, 20 eyeballs, um, struggles with low energy or maybe lack of sleep. Who here struggles with low energy uh, or like poor sleep? Put it below because that's another big um, indicator of cortisol in your system. Uh, Tracy says, yes, high core steals my energy to work out leading to more anxiety. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's like we're recognizing some of the, the reasons why you're having these, um, you know, symptoms, Tracy, and you have trouble falling asleep. Exactly. Okay. Uh, lack of sleep, Nicole, you said exactly. And Sherry um, energy. Yeah. You have low energy, Sherry. So you guys can see the impact of cortisol. All right. So let's go to number four. So number four, cortisol is going to impact weight gain. So why does cortisol impact weight gain is because uh, high cortisol impacts ghrelin and leptin. And I always talk about these two hunger signals and hunger hormones. So when there is high cortisol, hi Oshone, thanks for popping in. <laughs> um, high cortisol is 
uh, will actually cause ghrelin production to increase. Ghrelin production is the hormone that uh, causes you to want to eat more, right? You're when you're hungry, that's the signal, ghrelin, right? When it you your 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 belly grumbles and tells you you're hungry. So high cortisol actually. Uh, kind of produces almost a false signal, right? It actually uh, increases ghrelin production, makes you think you're hungry when you're probably not, you're just stressed. And then it leads to cravings and overeating, okay? Um, high cortisol also affects leptin and leptin is the fullness signal, okay? And it, it, it will impair leptin signal, meaning it will impair leptin. So, so leptin makes you feel full. But if it impairs it, you have leptin resistance. And leptin resistance means you actually don't know when you're full. That's problematic. That means you're going to overeat, eat too much, maybe eat and then really regret it later. <laughs> and it prevents you from feeling full and satisfied. How many of you um, here have cravings or kind of have this like not full feeling? Um, when you eat, when you eat, like you've eaten, but then like, like 30 minutes later or 45 minutes later, you still sort of hungry or you're sort of like not satisfied. You're not really hungry, but you feel like you still need to eat something. How many of you feel that way? You, Janet. Yeah. And Janet, maybe, maybe just so we know when we're reading this, um, just uh, say like um, uh, cravings or, um, you know, hunger signals, maybe put hunger signals, then I'll know that you're answering my question about hunger signals. Um, because, because I've been there again, you know, because hmm, Clarice was under a lot of stress before as a teacher. And I remember always being like, oh, I'm already eaten. I already eaten. I'm not that hungry, but I keep wanting to eat something. It's kind of this weird signal. And then you're like, well, maybe I should chew gum, which by the way, isn't the greatest either. But that's telling you that you have an itch to chew something. You have an itch to want to have something. You have an itch to want something. You're you're suddenly going to the pantry looking for something. But you're not really hungry. If you have those signals, I've been there. You have an imbalance in your ghrelin and leptin signal. It's probably related. Probably there are other hormone signals in place related to a lot of potential cortisol. Um, it could be water. Exactly. Maybe you're thirsty, right? Um, so all of these things that we just said above about sometimes not satisfied. Exactly. So it could be cortisol. It could be, um, you know, not, not drinking enough water. Someone said, which is also cortisol, by the way, um, when you don't drink enough water, your body's stressed and telling you a thing that it needs. And so um, this is something to keep in mind that when you have that itch feeling that you need something more, but you're really actually not hungry, you've eaten all the right things. Um, it, you need to be aware that this is probably caused by cortisol and the imbalances of your ghrelin and leptin. Okay. Um, also, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, gaining weight, increased cortisol will affect your digestive system, which I mentioned above already. Um, and it will impede digestion and kind of slow down gut motility. It will affect your microbiome. Cortisol will affect a lot of the microbiome in your system. And it, it impacts the ability for your body to absorb nutrition. So then this also means that you could have eaten, but you're still kind of undernourished because your body isn't taking in the nutrition it needs. So this can lead to, um, you know, unexplained weight gain or even plateau, right? Because your body isn't getting what it needs. So what does it do is stalls you out, right? So there's a lot of reasons why like your cortisol in so many different ways, like I had named off like 10 different reasons you could have cortisol in your system can be the reason why you're still gaining weight or wait, maybe you're plateaued. Who here is, uh, feel like they're still gaining weight, say weight gain or plateau? Who here still is feeling like you're gaining weight or plateauing? Um, put it below, okay? And Tracy says, I get hungry for fun foods at 2, 3 a.m. Not good. And maybe that's because 2, 3 a.m., your body is stressed or lacking sleep or needing sleep, but can't sleep and cortisol is high, right, Tracy? So, um, 
And so, yeah, so Jennifer says maybe plateau. Um, and Denise said plateau. Uh, I see India joined us as well. And so it could lead to that uh, weight gain or that plateau. Um, so kind of understanding uh, the biggest thing is to understand that there could be cortisol at the root of this. It's not the only reason, but that could be the root of why you might be suddenly gaining weight or being at a plateau. Okay. And Janet is at a plateau and Kat is weight gain and plateau. Right. So see, so a lot of people are experiencing this. Um, and I'm going to, you know, I want you guys to keep sticking around because uh, I'm going to, when I get to the menopause situation, we're going to talk even more about, about why it gets even worse. Right. So let's talk about number five. So number five is visceral fat gain, the belly fat. Okay. So why is it that cortisol is now termed the number one belly fat depositing hormone, which is the title of my live is because you may not know this, but when cortisol is super high in your system, it has a signal that is within the visceral fat area that actually attracts the cortisol and like the fat, okay? So the visceral fat area has higher higher cortisol receptors and the, it has a lot of cortisol receptors. So when cortisol is super high, basically, and it will like kind of basically attach in all the fat cells to the visceral fat area, okay? Obviously, I mean like, biologically it's not like exactly like a magnet but like i'm just trying to give you an, a picture to think about okay so i want you to think about this everything i've said about uh, cortisol causing potential weight gain um causing imbalance of blood sugar causing all these uh ghrelin leptin imbalances which could cause you to overeat and having wrong signals in your body is causing fat to be deposited right but why is it not depositing into other areas and it's just going straight to your belly? And this is the reason why it's going straight to your belly because the cortisol receptors are the highest within your visceral area. And so if you don't control cortisol, you will gain fat very fast in the middle of your belly, around your organs. And that's not what we want. Right. So this this is why we have to be uh, very good at controlling cortisol within our system and understanding why that visceral fat situation is happening. Um, and of course, there is other factors involved with why it moves to the center based on hormone signals, um, which I'll talk about when we talk about menopause. Okay. So that's, that's one of the biggest reasons. So I want to, I want to know everyone who's watching here, um, Rosalind and, and Sarisa, that's a nice name. Did you know Sarisa? I wanted to be called Clarissa. That was like originally my, I wanted to be called Clarissa. <laughs> um, so how many of you on here, uh, struggle with visceral fat put your hand up, put visceral fat below. If you struggle with visceral fat, put visceral fat below, okay? And there is a scary part to it, which I've mentioned before. Some of you may not think you have a belly because it's not protruding, but it doesn't mean that you don't have visceral fat within us, you're within you. Um, it could be inside, right? But how many of you believe you do have visceral fat in your body, visceral fat? You're welcome, Sarissa. Uh, Jennifer says visceral fat. Tracy, you have always had visceral fat, right? And Sherry has visceral fat. Um, Jalen, Jalen says she has visceral fat. Exactly. So a lot of people, right? And so, and it gets worse with age. It gets worse with high stress situations and all of that, right? Um, Janice says yes. Okay. Now, closely related, we're going to move on from the visceral fat to number six, which is it's related. It's related. They're all connected, really. It's just I divide points to make it easier to understand. So number six is still connected to visceral fat or like systems uh, affecting the entire system is inflammation. Okay. So cortisol causes inflammation in your system. It is an inflammatory response. Okay. So if you have high cortisol, you might as well say your system is inflamed, right? And you guys kind of know this, this is almost common knowledge. Um, but this further contributes to visceral fat deposit. Why? Because 
visceral fat is highly metabolically active and it is highly inflammatory. It produces cytokines within the visceral, uh, visceral fat cells. So again, I kind of say this magnet analogy so you guys can understand is when you have high cortisol uh, and it causes a big inflammation spike in your system, the inflammation like a base would be your belly. And it's kind of like, oh, inflammation? let's all just go to the center. And it just keeps going there because of, uh, you know, not only what I said above, you know, but like, like the cortisol receptors, but because of the inflammatory environment it's creating in your system. Now this, uh, I see lots of visceral fat coming in and Latrice says visceral fat as well. Exactly. Uh, visceral fat runs in both sides of the family, Tracy. Yes. But it's not just genetic. It, 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 is largely due to lifestyle. Okay. It can have a minor part of genetics, but it is largely due to lifestyle. So um, when you have increased inflammation in your system, um, beyond just visceral fat, it also affects uh, arthritis. Okay. Chronic inflammation is the driver to many types of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, arthritis, uh, a progression of osteoarthritis. And so this is important because as a lot of you age and you deal with arthritis, yes, a small part of it is genetic. I understand, but a large part of it is due to lifestyle factors and not controlling inflammation within your system. Okay. So this will lead to more arthritic, arthritic pain in your body. Um, if you are someone who has a lot of pain and uncomfortableness as you age or in menopause, um, this could also be due to high cortisol, high inflammation, um, because it, high cortisol causes increased pain sensation in your body. Okay. It increases pain sensation in your body, and it can also affect neurological things in your body where your nervous system is just more sensitive. It has more tingling, more, you know, some people have shooting pain, not everybody, but you know, um, if you have pain in your body, that often does mean there's a lot of inflammation happening in your system, which the root of that often comes from high cortisol. Okay. So, um, and, and Jalen, it's, I think, I think the biggest thing you have to understand is this is to help you understand why a lot of you struggle with a lot of this and the pain and all of that, but it's to empower you because obviously these things can be controlled, right? So uh, Jalen, as long as we have the right mindset on this so that you can go, okay, I can learn to control this. And this is the, this is the best part of that. Um, and so how many of you believe that you struggle with inflammation. Now, it's a big topic. I talk about inflammation all the time, but today's topic is specifically related to cortisol and cortisol's impact on inflammation. If you struggle with inflammation, I want you to put inflammation below. Uh, inflammation is something um, that I address a lot. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're going to be doing one final launch for our 21 day anti-inflammation system. Like I talked about last time, it's coming down in a few weeks time. It is going to be the final time we're going to do that, that course. And then we're going to, that will be the close off of that program. So if you want to learn more about inflammation, I want you to put inflammation below. Um, I will say that inflammation is probably one of the most important things you want to learn to control as you age, because as you age, naturally your body's inflammation increases. As you hit menopause, inflammation increases. As your hormones drop, inflammation increases. As cortisol is rising in your body, as you get stressed or have all this life stressors, inflammation rises. And so now you are dealing with four or five times fold of inflammation in your system. And if you don't learn to control inflammation, this is the precursor to a lot of chronic diseases in your body. So if you're, if you're someone that's like, I need to learn more about inflammation, I want you to put inflammation below. Okay. All right. So that's number six. Ready? So we're going to go into number seven, which is the correlation between cortisol and menopause. Okay. So what I want to talk about specifically, um, so you have lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, Rochelle, Rochelle, I like your name. Um, yeah. So some of this, I know 
can be um, an autoimmune disease um, and, and you might already have it, but you can greatly control the symptoms, Rochelle, by controlling um, inflammation through proper nutrition and proper ways of exercising and all of that. Um, so Nicola says, I have inflammation, otherwise it wouldn't be sore. I'm in menopause and I'm stressed, right? Exactly, Nicole. I'm going to talk about this right away here. So what I want to say is that, you know, um, there's a complex relationship between cortisol and menopause, okay? Cortisol by itself does not cause menopausal symptoms. Menopausal symptoms is caused by obviously all of the, the drop in estrogen and all that that's happening during menopause. But chronic stress and elevated cortisol can exasperate the situation of already menopausal symptoms. So this is where we have to be really, really now understanding like, could we, could we help ourselves not have such severe menopausal symptoms? Or if we're dealing with all these things that we feel horrible during menopause, could we actually control this more? Okay. So we're going to take a moment to talk about this. Okay. So first of all, um, stress and the, and your hormone balance. Okay. So the correlation between cortisol and sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone, those types of things, there's a strong correlation. And I talked about this in my muscle sculpting masterclass, those who have taken it before that there is something called an HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland axis. Okay. This axis um, is where it's going to travel down and actually figure out, should I produce cortisol or should I produce estrogen or testosterone or, you know, other hormones? And when it is under a high stress situation, your body makes the decision to take that pathway and move it to cortisol, which means that if a lot of your resources are diverted away from uh, creating estrogen and progesterone and, and testosterone and things like that, you're already dealing with menopause. You already are dropping in estrogen. You already have hormones that are now declining very, very fast. And if you don't learn to control cortisol, cortisol will make everything worse within menopause. It will make ev all your symptoms much worse. Okay. So this is why learning how to uh, control cortisol is going to be very important. Otherwise, it's going to move uh, so many things away from your sex hormone production. And you don't want that. You already are decreasing in your sex hormone production. Okay. So that's number one of why if you have high stress and you don't control it, it gets even worse. Secondly, your hot flashes and night sweats. Um, so hot flash and night sweat relate to changes in your body temperature. And when you are high stress and cortisol, it really messes with the temperature regulation of your body. So that's why if you are high stress, it can make everything worse, can make your hot flashes worse, uh, night sweats worse. Um, and, uh, yeah, I see Tracy said macros and weight training helped with menopausal symptoms a lot. Yes, because the proper nutrition, the proper way of training greatly helps you stabilize cortisol symptoms and, and other, other areas to inflammation in your system. So that's why it helps a lot, Tracy. So Tracy's in the uh, muscle accelerator program right now. Um, yeah. And then Nicole says, yes, I have inflammation. Otherwise, oh, I already read that. Yes. It wouldn't be sore. Exactly. Okay. Number three. So uh, in terms of menopause and cortisol, so Menopausal women may already experience mood changes due to the fluctuating um, hormones, but chronic stress can exasperate these emotional symptoms. Remember, I talked about how chronic stress and cortisol affects neurotransmitters. And so now not only is your changing sex hormones uh, causing you like mood swings and things like that, but your cortisol is further affecting neurotransmitters. And so you have more anxiety, more um, just like just tension in your body that you don't feel good, right? So it affects mood and makes it worse. Um, sleep dis disturbances. So um, menopausal women already have poor quality of sleep. We know that. And Tracy has, is experiencing that right now. But like I said, cortisol impacts your sleep quality. So if you already don't sleep well with menopausal symptoms, add on cortisol, it just makes it worse. I know you're seeing the pattern here now, right? You're seeing that cortisol just makes everything worse. Um, 
and weight gain. So this is the part where I want to talk about it. So already, like I mentioned, cortisol will cause a potential weight gain due to the effect of ghrelin and leptin um, and potentially the imbalance of blood sugar levels. Okay. But because of your shifting um, sex hormones, the drop of estrogen and the rise of your androgen hormones, uh, the signal of where the fat should go gets signaled to the midsection more, right? So this is why you gain weight, but you're like, why is it gaining in my middle? I don't understand. Why is it just my middle? You know, I want some to go to my butt, but it's not going to my butt. It's going to my midsection, right? And that is all dictated by the hormone signal that uh, the estrogen is dropping, the androgen hormones are going up. And, and so you're you already might be gaining weight from, let's say, you don't know your nutrition too well, your blood sugar levels are not quite stable, your ghrelin, your leptin signals, and your cravings are not controlled. Now you add on menopause and the changing sex hormones, and now that is leading to a faster gain into your midsection. So I, I again, like, like, let's, for you to understand why 95% of women in menopause, as you age, you all deal with something with your belly. It's this is why there's so many reasons behind this, right? Um, and so how many of you guys, uh, I think some of you already answered above, but how many of you guys actually really struggle with belly fat, really struggle with belly fat? If you already answered above, you don't have to answer again. But if you really struggle with belly fat, put belly fat below, because this is there's so many reasons. And this is another thing I'll say is that's why when you comes to decreasing belly fat, it isn't about targeting one thing. You want to really have an approach that will, uh, that will work in multiple ways to be able to help you lower that belly fat overall. Right. So, um, yeah. So Janice says belly fat that you struggle with. And I know so many women watching this or rewatching this is going to say they struggle with belly fat and not just women, men as well. <laughs> Men have belly fat as well. I mean, you start observing older men, you guys all look around, they all got some fat on that belly, unless they are really good with their nutrition, they are really good in the gym. Otherwise, they will have that belly fat as well. Um, uh, Sherry says struggling and Cass says at the moment, struggling with belly fat, perimenopause, definitely a factor. Yes, exactly. Um, and then as well, in terms of menopause, um, and cortisol, it will also affect bone health. So here's the thing, during menopause, as your estrogen levels decline, it will have a negative impact on your bone health. This is part of menopause. Now you add in cortisol and cortisol has a huge impact in affecting bone density and increasing your risk of osteoporosis. So again, learning to control cortisol is extremely important because it will speed up the loss of your bone mass. Okay. So that's another thing. Um, another thing, the co connection between uh, menopause and cortisol is memory and cognitive function. Okay. Um, again, there's a lot of things that happens with your memory and things like that during menopause, but chronic stress affects uh, that even further, um, because again, of neurotransmitters and things that is affecting the signaling, right? So, uh, it, you know, the biggest thing is understanding that you're probably going to go through menopause, no matter what this is going to happen to you. But there are lots of things that you can do to control it because cortisol is a hormone that is fully controllable by you. Can I say that again? Cortisol is a hormone that is fully controllable by you. You can't control always the level and speed of your estrogen level decline. Um, that's you're going through menopause, all of this stuff. The cortisol mainly is based in lifestyle factors. And this is where I want all of you to really uh, make sure that you keep in mind for yourself. When you hear all these things I'm explaining to you, I want you to go, okay, so this is the high impact of why cortisol um, is like, why it's affecting me. Now, what do I have to do to learn to mitigate cortisol in my system? Okay. So I'm going to give you a, just a few quick things. Um, I just see, so we got to go. Yes, this was good. I'm glad that this really helped Tracy. <laughs> this is a 160 and uh, 130 lives later. I do another cortisol live, you know? Um, so a couple of things, if cortisol is such a big issue in so many people, uh, one of the things I will say, I'm going to go back to is nutrition. 
If your nutrition is not on par, if you don't understand what inflames your body, if you don't understand the how to eat, the patterns of eating to not cause increased stress in your body, you need to learn how to have good nutrition. And, and, and in my opinion, the right macros, although you know, you can still be healthy without understanding fully macros, but the better you understand macros, the better you can control stress response in your system. And so, you know, I would say nutrition is actually one of the most important things to control cortisol. So if you don't know your nutrition well enough, um, and you think you need to learn more about nutrition, I want you to put nutrition below. Okay. Because this is going to be one of the biggest ways you're going to help yourself control inflammation as well as control cortisol in your system. Okay, so put nutrition below if you feel like you need to learn more about that. Okay, so that's that's number that's number one. Number two, exercise. A lot of you exercise a lot, except I want to just challenge you to think about what kinds of exercise you're doing and is it helping you or is it increasing the cortisol spike in your body? Okay, because if you work out in the incorrect way, um, and you overtrain, or you do too much, or you uh, somehow are not uh, regulating the way you train, uh, or recovering right, uh, you have too much hit, you do too much group classes, you do uh, too much cardio, and I'm not talking to you. Um, <laughs> you know who it is who uh, Jennifer, you're like, I'm, I'm laughing because she says she has too much cardio. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> she doesn't do that much cardio. She just doesn't like cardio. So she always says she doesn't want to do cardio. You do need to do a little bit of cardio, but you you don't need to do like an hour or four, like 45 minutes of it. It's like, if you have too much of it, then it can elevate your cortisol, right? Um, so if you feel like you don't really know how to train and how to work out, that is another thing you need to learn to control cortisol. And, and I'm going to say one more thing too, is I was just doing an assessment on Angelina and I know she's not on here, but we talked a lot about her movement patterns and her squats and her lunges and all of this. And the way she was doing it, um, she's moving, but she's not effectively hitting her muscles. And one of the things I said is that like, you could do so much and you can um, work out all you want, but you're still not getting the results. So you keep trying to work out harder and you keep causing more cortisol in your system when you could actually do less with better technique, hit your muscle more effectively and actually like have less cortisol spike in your system and have better muscle development. And, and she was like, oh my gosh, I've never felt my legs like this before. I'm like, yeah, because you were not squatting the right way, nor were you lunging the proper way. And, and all the work she's doing is not that it's bad. She's exercising. She's not producing effective results. And if you know what I always say is you need to work out in a way that produces effective results, or you're wasting your time, unless you're okay with not it depends your goal. I'm going to say that again. If your goal is not to be like toned and sculpted, that's fine. You just exercise to exercise. If your goal is to be toned and sculpted and you want nice muscles, you need to know how to exercise properly in a way that does not spike your cortisol level and over exercise your body that in an unnecessary way. Right. So if you feel like, okay, I need to also understand better exercise program. I want you to put exercise program there. Okay. And the third thing I always say, and I always say these are like the three legs of the stool is mindset. Okay. Mindset relates to emotional, psychological stressors, right? And this is very important. I always say how you deal with things in your mind um, is going to affect whether you have cortisol sec secreting in your system. And I would say if you struggle with my mentality, mindset, self-sabotage, negative thoughts, anxiety, like a lot of the things that you struggle with, um, you know, maybe put mindset below. Because mindset regulation is, we may think it's the third element and less important, but I actually think that mindset affects a lot of people more than they think. That you have more cortisol spike in your system that you don't know because of what you're thinking right here. 
and the way you're processing emotions and stress and holding on to stress and different things like that. So if you tend to self-sabotage or you don't really work on mindset, I want you to put mindset below so that you also know that to control cortisol, it's not just about exercise, it's not just about nutrition, but it is also about mindset. And so this is kind of why I go back to this. I say that if you want to truly be totally like kind of holistically healthy, you have to have a holistic approach to your your whole program. You can't just go, I'm just going to work out hard and I'm going to lose my belly, says most women who want goals and work out hard and then they can't lose their belly. Then the person's like, I'm going to work on my nutrition. And then they work so hard on the nutrition and they work hard on their on their exercise, but they still have a belly. And, and then my next question is, I'm like, how is your lifestyle? How are you sleeping? How are you your mindset? What are you saying here? Because there's a lot that all interacts together, right? Um, and Sherry says mindset, Karen says mindset. So you definitely need to work on that. And thank you for being honest, Karen, so you can identify that. So um, I'll just wrap up with this is if you have been struggling with the belly fat for a long time and you don't know how to address it, um, I want you to drop programs below because that is one of the biggest things that I work on is to help women drop that belly fat. But I, I obviously I, I approach it from the things we talked about here because I really do think you have to have all of them. You need to know your nutrition. You have to have the right exercise programs. And you need to have proper mindsets. Jennifer, we worked on mindset a lot. And even now I know you're doing some mindset exercises with me. And I know that it's helped. You know, it's definitely helped. And um, yeah, so put programs below if you feel like you want to learn more about our holistic program to start to decrease belly fat. And hopefully you found that helpful. And I will see you all next week. Um, and if you found this helpful as well, you know, tag your friends or let them know about this live. Okay, I will see you all next week.